Lady and gentlemen, that was I led two lives. I led three lives. I led two lives. Okay, start off, my dear Miss Drury. What's wrong with that picture? A delicate <laughs> what film. What is it? <laughs> what that delicate film about transvestites <laughs> and transsexuals? Very delicate psychiatric subject. Well, I think Ed Wood's really ingenious. I mean, he didn't have a lot of money. He wanted to make a film. He goes out and he pulls all kinds of little uh, knickknacks from the film world and draws them into his film. The, the uh, cars on the highway, the industrial footage, uh, the airplanes, uh, that lovely little African scenario. Uh, the man really was a genius, I think. With those uh, masks where they're beating, the boom, 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 that's boom, right. boom. That's right. He, um, he uh, drew all kinds of different elements together to make a film that uh, really is sort of uh, his autobiographical film. Ed Wood himself was a transvestite, and uh, he decided to make a film uh, about the problem, and I think it's a very sensitive uh, treatment of the film. There's a suggestion that in, the, in the treatment of, of Ed Wood that he had been a transvestite for quite a, a long time and had been proud of it and had, had been so in the Marines, and when he landed, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it was in Europe or in Japan somewhere, but under his battle fatigues, he was wearing panties and a brassiere. Um, so he, he, he firmly believed in this lifestyle and carried it with him wherever he went. Even in the Marines? In the Marines. Of course, there's a character in one of the stories in our picture who goes through the soldier's life, doesn't he? Right. You wonder how in heck. You know, it's a uh, boy, oh boy. Hey. Is he dead now, Wood, by the way? Yes, he... Uh, What's his full name? Edward Wood, is it? Edward, Edward D. Wood, Wood Jr. Jr. Edward D. He made uh, the greatest of the bad, I guess you might yes, say. Yes, he's uh, uniformly, uh, universally recognized as the worst director of all time. That's because of his body of work, too, which includes uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space and Bride of the Monster, his Bela Lugosi trilogy. Oh, really? You say, I have so much to see. I've got to come down to Ottawa, <laughs> spend a week with Plan 9. <laughs> production. I want to carry on with our, our journey. Now, we did the thing with two heads, didn't we? I think we did before our picture. The horror of Party Beach, you've got written down in your letter to me here as one of your favorite baddies uh, it, of all time. It's one of my favorites. It's, uh, I think, probably the only feature film ever filmed entirely on location in New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, when we showed this film in New York, a lot of the sons and daughters of people who had been involved in this film came along to see it, and I think they quite enjoyed it as much as everyone else. It's it, 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 like a lot of bad films, is a message film. Um, we've just seen a message film about transvestism, and a, a lot of Edward D. Wood's films had to do with uh, atomic power, long before the China Syndrome kind of thing. And this film has to do with radioactive waste that turns uh, uh, dead bodies in the, in the ocean into uh, creatures that invade a, a beach party. The odd thing about, uh, there's a beach party going on and uh, people are being murdered and next day they're all back at the beach and <laughs> dancing, singing, they're being murdered again. Oh. They don't seem to learn much from experience and maybe that's the uh, message of both this film and uh, this whole thing. <laughs> that, that's fantastic. The, the, uh, yeah, I may, the, yeah, certainly, Barry. The original uh, music for this film was done by a group called the Del Airs, I believe. And when we uh, had the festival in New York, we had certain members of the Del Airs in the audience, and they were brave enough to stand up and identify themselves to everybody, and they got a rousing oh, I bet hand. They, I, bet, I bet they did. They I bet did. they did for the yeah, hand. That's, it was that's, wonderful to that's, have them that's there. A, that's a choice, a choice coincidence. The, mo the monsters in yeah. this film are so bad that um, you notice in the film that the camera never focuses on them. It's always focused on the background, so you get these sort of hazy monsters that come in obviously throughout the course of the film their costumes fall apart so that by the end the monsters that you see are entirely different from the monsters at the beginning they're minus uh, these strange vegetable growths that they have at the beginning of the film i guess they just fell off it just <laughs> they didn't bother they have no continuity girls and no makeup girls to really worry about we found out that they seem to be like chicken waddles hanging down here and the, it, it turns out that they were latex gloves filled with some kind of putty that oh, no. that was the extent of the special effects yeah. in that film Nothing worse than an impoverished monster. Wow. Nothing <laughs> tackier, tacky, seedy, really tacky. cheap, cheap. The next title is is one at least I do know about. I've heard about, but I've never seen it again. They saved Hitler's brain. Which one of you wants the uh, the dubious honor of leading off in this one? Do you, Dave, I'll, take one I'll take, take it. it. It's it's one of my favorites too. As I mentioned before, uh, Stanley Stanley Cortez was the cinematographer on here. Uh, Orson Welles cinematographer on the Magnificent Ambersons. Uh, I think uh, this must have been the nadir of his career. 
It's a dreadful film. It's made by David Bradley, who is now a film professor at the University of uh, California, in Los Angeles. And uh, uh, I don't know how he ever became a film professor because this film is quite dreadful. Uh, it seems to be made in two parts. The first part uh, in about 1964, judging by the costumes, the cars, and everything. And then the second part of the film is totally unrelated to the beginning. And it takes place, uh, it was probably made in about 1959, and it takes place in a dusty South American banana republic where remnants of the SS have stowed uh, not only Hitler's brain, but his entire head. And uh, so they have <laughs> Hitler's entire head in a bulletproof pickle jar, which they carry around with That's them. That's absurd. It's a message film, too, Elwi. It has, uh, it's an anti-nerve gas film, this one. Uh, a lot of messages here. Lauren Drury, what is the, uh, give us the feminine point of view when they saved it. Is there anything to add to that, or is that...? Well, there's one, one uh, central character at the beginning of the film. Um, she gets shot halfway through. Somebody once referred to as a, her as a dumb bimbo in a miniskirt, and she's uh, sort of a dubious CIA agent. Um, she, uh, she hooks up with another fellow, uh, and they're trying to solve the... Uh, uh, the great mystery of Mandoras, which is this dusty banana republic. They know something funny is going on down there, but you never actually find out till later in the film what's going on. And you don't actually see Hitler's entire head until later in the film. Uh, Hitler sits inside this sort of Florence flask and screams out orders uh, to the SS and says, Mach, Schne Mach Schnell a lot and Achtung and this kind of thing. It's uh, very... Uh, by it's very strange. His head was played by Bernard Fried. <laughs> I don't know. I, we haven't seen the head. <laughs> Bernard Fried played the head. Played the, the head. God. Yeah. I've never heard anything. Bernard so H. Fried. Oh, the the glories of the inept. Eh. God. The next one I hear is, have is Russ Tamblin, whom I do remember, and Mamie Van Doren, whom I would remember a lot better than Russ Tamblin, in a picture called High School Confidential that you've got listed. Which one of you would like to uh, jab into that one? Well, that's, that's another one of my favorites. So yeah. Perhaps I, I'd talk about that. That's uh, uh, that film. It's a fast-paced uh, film that was made by Albert uh, Zugsmith, who went on to make a, a number of. Uh, yeah, let me get that again for our viewers. Albert Zugsmith. Zugsmith. Yeah. Zugsmith, a name. Yes, and a director too. He. Uh, Albert Zugsmith also made Dondi, which is another uh, really dreadful film. Sorry. Featuring the world, worst child actor of all time. <laughs> Little Dondi, the Dondi. Italian <laughs> waif orphan. Little oh. Dondi. Bad, 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 bad. High School Confidential, though, it features, uh, I, there are a lot of Mamie Van Doren fan clubs, uh, especially in the United States, uh, especially in New York City, and they turn out in droves to watch Mamie do anything. Uh, Mamie, Mamie is uh, probably the worst actress ever to appear on the screen. Uh, one reviewer said uh, about this film that she manages to coil herself around the refrigerator like a python, and uh, <laughs> uh, she, she's that type of a that type of an actress. But she plays, uh, ironically, she plays uh, Ruth Tamlin's aunt in this. It's the probably the worst miscasting uh, you'll find anywhere. <laughs> Very, uh, it's distinguished mainly though by its dialogue, uh, which is kind of hip teen lingo from the 50s, as imagined by somebody who seem to have spent their life uh, somewhere else, perhaps in a different culture or speaking a different language. Very amusing. Interesting thing is a, a local group that's quite popular, a uh, rock group called Rough Trade, has a new album out, and one of the, uh, one of the titles of cuts is High School Confidential, and we get mentions of Mamie Van Doren in it, and they've, spiked heels. and They've picked up the cue. They've picked yeah. up the cue. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Well, our odyssey into the inept and horrible continues now with that title that was uttered earlier in our chat uh, this evening. I shall have the pleasure of reading it, The Incredibly Strange Creatures Who Stopped Living and Became Mixed Up Zombies. Actually, it was originally Lauren. called The Incredibly Strange Creatures of the Midway Who Stopped Living and Became Mixed Up Zombies. That title proved a little unwieldy, so, so they, they cut it down. <laughs> they cut, <laughs> they cut it down. Right. Cut that, it down from 70 words to 60. That's the one that, uh, that Vilmo Zygmunt and uh, Laszlo that's Kovacs right. were involved in. And actually, their names in the credits appear differently. I guess this is before.